It's the year 1958. Location, Los Angeles, California. It's a beautiful summer day, and we see a man walking down a street filled with various stores. He looks stressed out. The same stress you see on the hundreds of other people trying to make it in Hollywood. But as he is walking, something catches the corner of his eye in the display case of a music store. It's a tape recorder for exactly $200, the exact amount of money one Ross Bagdasarian has to his name, taken from his family savings account. He stops for a moment, looks at the price tag of the tape recorder, then back at the money in his hands, and then decides to walk into the store. Little did Ross know that not only would this choice lead him down a path into creating one of America's most recognizable music groups and a life of fame and fortune, but also pave the way over the next 60 years so that this can exist. <laughs> Sounds a bit far-stretched? I assure you it isn't. Strap in, because in this video we're going to take a look into the history of virtual celebrity and how it will change content creation forever. After purchasing the tape recorder, Ross began work on the song, The Witch Doctor. I told the witch doctor I was in love with you. Upon release, it was an instant hit and propelled Ross, stage name David Savell, into the limelight. What made this song so special was its use of sped up vocals, which although were not unheard of at this point, Ross was the first to utilize it in the way that this chart topper did. What Ross followed this up with, however, would change everything. He released a Christmas record under the name The Chipmunks, which rose to heights far beyond the Witch Doctor ever did. It stars three cartoon characters by the names of Alvin, Simon, and Theodore, each named after a record label executive respectively. It was the novelty band that kicked off what we now know as virtual celebrities. A virtual celebrity can be defined as a fictional character that not only performs its purpose within its works, but also has meta-contextual lore outside of that work, giving the character a virtual life as a means to replicate actual celebrity. A less head-scratching way of looking at it is as follows. Under this definition, something like Mickey Mouse, which is a character restrained by its fictional world, does not qualify. But Alvin and the Chipmunks, who have lore describing them as actual real-life musicians that have lives outside of their music, do. The craze for Alvin has spawned a short-lived TV show, multiple albums, and plenty of rip-offs such as the Nutty Squirrels. Over the next few decades, we saw a sort of normalization of virtual celebrity. We saw acts like the Archies taking the titular comic book characters and turning them into a band for their animated TV show. Now, the Riverdale Carnival presents the Archie. This was successful enough to actually make their track Sugar Sugar a number one hit single for the year 1969. During this period, we also saw Jim Henson's The Muppets rise to global popularity. It's The Muppet Show with our very special guest. Although Jim Henson would bring The Muppets onto talk shows and utilize them as virtual celebrities slightly before and during the rise of Elvin and the Chipmunks, the property didn't come onto its own until both Sesame Street and The Muppet Show aired during the 60s and 70s. Specifically, with The Muppet Show, the plot revolved around the characters being the ones putting the broadcast together, further cementing these characters into our reality and the public consciousness. Skipping ahead, The Muppets only grew as virtual celebrities as time went on, with guest appearances on many talk shows and even showing up at, uh, the Game Awards. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you! Greetings, fellow gaming enthusiasts! Into the 80s, pop culture was already familiar with multiple virtual celebrities. At this point, most of them were targeted towards general audiences and made expressly for marketing potential. Enter Max Headroom. Max Headroom. In 1985, MTV was kicking off, and Channel 4 in the UK wanted a piece of that action. They contacted Annabelle Jenkel, Rocky Morton, and George Stone to create a show that could present music videos on their channel. During the development of the show, they realized a lot of American TV hosts at the time were fake, loud, and obnoxious, and they wanted to paradise both them and the capitalist consumer's world that the host represented. They came up with the character of Max Headroom. He was to be presented as the first computer-generated host, and came with an impressive backstory. Max Headroom comes from a dystopian version of our world, where TV stations control everything and ratings are currency. There's also a subplot about commercials that kill people. This lore was displayed through a made-for-TV movie with HBO called Max Headroom, 20 Minutes Into the Future. Now because I designed Blipverts to compress 30 seconds of advertising information into three seconds, some particularly slothful, perpetual viewers literally explode. Simple as that. It proved to be a success, 
And three days later, the music video program starring Max Headroom aired to even bigger acclaim. Soon after, Max Headroom was inescapable. He was appearing, interviewing celebrities. I mean, I don't like using the word rival. <laughs> but you know, I think I've actually got one. Eh? Advertising new Coke. What I'm talking about, and you're not, is that more people prefer the new refreshing taste of Coke over Pepsi. And getting his image plastered on every product you could think of. Through his rise in popularity, Max became the very thing he was supposed to satire. A victim of entertainment consumerism, and just as quickly as he rose, Max Hedrum fell from the public consciousness, becoming an artifact of a time gone. In the late 90s and early 2000s, Blur frontman Darren Albarn and Tank Girl creator Jamie Hewlett were sitting down watching MTV together and thought to themselves, similarly to what Channel 4 did, that the bands and music videos on display were boring and not taking advantage of the medium. So they created a new band, one that would comprise of fictional members with deep backstories, the Gorillas. There's Murdoch, the green-skinned Satanist basis mastermind who put the band together. Oh yeah, oh yeah, I forgot you lot were coming. Right. Then 2D, the band's singer. Yeah, things did get quite hostile. Um, it was all a bit weird, actually. Russell, their drummer, who's also possessed by the ghosts of his dead friends and also known to be an occasional giant. If you keep doing this, man, I'm gonna be jumping you. And Noodle, the young guitar prodigy from Japan, who also happens to be a super soldier. Anyway, with this lineup of characters and a story that would play out in phases leading up to and directly after each album release, the Gorillas had a winning formula to make waves in the music industry. With multiple Grammy nominations and wins, plenty of MTV Music Video Awards, and collaborations with some of the greatest musicians of all time, the Gorillas are the first virtual celebrities to really hit this level of mainstream appeal and to be taken seriously. Now wait a minute, you might say. What about the Muppets? Didn't they also get mainstream appeal even larger than this? True. But the difference here is that they were not made with the specific intentions of being virtual celebrities. It just happened indirectly, while the Gorillas were from the beginning virtual celebrities first. We've seen Elvin and the Chipmunks and the Muppets make waves normalizing the idea of the virtual celebrity, Max Headroom showing how easily corporations can take advantage of the V-Celeb, and the Gorillas making the world take it seriously. But now with the widespread use of the internet, it was time for a new chapter in virtual celebrity. At the turn of the century, we saw a glimpse of what the internet could do for the V-Celebs through services like Jamstar, who would sell ringtones for cell phones for a monthly subscription service. Jamstar tended to pick things that would arise from the internet to cash in on trends. Two notable examples of this are the Gummy Bear song and of course, Crazy Frog, who went from this viral video to having live concerts, multiple albums, and even video games. Although this was big for opening up the potential for the internet to get in on the V-Celeb action, nothing could prepare for what would come in 2007. A Japanese company by the name of Krypton Future Media released a new version of their Vocaloid software, which allowed its users to create synthetic vocals using a prepackaged voice. For this release, that voice was Hatsune Miku, and came packaged with a full character design for her. What set this software apart was that not only did it come with a visual for the synthetic voice, but it also allowed its users to use that Vocaloid character without the fear of copyright issues. It was completely public domain. The internet took it and ran. By 2009, Hatsune Miku was inescapable online. It allowed the general populace to create a virtual celebrity as a community. When Hatsune Miku would do concerts with the aid of hologram technology, she would sing songs created by the fans. When her face was plastered on every product, it wasn't the company that profited, it was the person who sold it. <laughs> Including, but not limited to, Domino's Pizza. Look, look at this. Look, <laughs> come on, look at this dude. Look, look at that smile. He doesn't know who Hatsune Miku is. He just, look at, this, look at the way he's smiling and holding the phone. And the, what is that? Hatsune Miku was a virtual celebrity created and facilitated by the people. It's no wonder that on her first American tour in 2014, she was able to open for Lady Gaga and appear on the David Letterman show. Like being on Willie Nelson's bus. While more traditional virtual celebrities remain prevalent going into the 2010s, especially in K-pop with bands like KDA and Aespa, we saw an overall larger amount of virtual celebrities who took the form of internet content creators and influencers. Take both Kizuna Ai and Little Makila, for example. Both owned by larger companies who specialized in V-Celebs, these characters were created to try and bring the concept to a younger audience, and it worked spectacularly. Kizuna Ai, in particular, spawned an entire genre of content creation entitled VTubers. They would use motion capture technology to become their characters on both YouTube and live streams through Twitch. At this point, the power is in the people's hands, even more so than with Hatsune Miku. 
Most of the software required for entry into being a VTuber is free, meaning all that is needed to become a virtual celebrity in the modern day is a computer and a decent internet connection. This is an incredibly powerful tool. It allows people to not only experience fame while remaining anonymous, but also open the doors for a new way of self-expression the world has never seen before. We are at a point where anyone can have an online avatar separate from themselves. That being said, we have also seen a rise of companies trying to take advantage of this newfound independence of V-Celebs. For example, Hololive is a company that entirely revolves around VTubers and marketing them beyond anything seen before it. There are actually 52 different VTubers under their umbrella. It is a very lucrative business, and with the normalization of V-Celeb influencers, it makes sense that the companies would want to push hard for it. Unlike humans, V-Celebs have no flaws, no career-ruining controversies, no opinions or thoughts of their own that can conflict with the will of the talent agency or general populace. They are the perfect celebrity. For a comparison of what may happen in the future, look no further than the posthumous careers of many musicians. As soon as the career is cut short, the record labels rush to put together albums of unreleased works and features to the highest bidders, with these usually topping the charts at number one. They place their likeness on every product they can, and in the case of Tupac and Whitney Houston, hologram concerts similar to Hatsune Miku. They turn these real people into virtual celebrities. Companies are not afraid to replace the human element of celebrity, and going into the future, we may see this become more and more common with posthumous careers and built from scratch virtual celebrities. For better, or for worse. Hello, it's uh, it's good to be back. We're uh, we're happy to uh, to uh, see you guys again, and um, we uh, we hope to try and get more content out to you guys more regularly. Uh, so make sure to hit that subscribe button, and um, also please like and uh, comment as while you're at it, because um, especially comment. Like I, I want to hear what uh, what you guys think about uh, the V celebs. Which one's your favorite? Which ones you might have missed? And uh, also. What uh, what kind of talks you might want us to cover next time? Because um, we are definitely open up to user submitted ideas and exploring those. Um, so yeah, glad to be back. Uh, me, John, and Andrew are very excited for the future. And uh, see you next time.